Why do I have this word, identity? Anyone have any idea? What does identity have to do with genocide? I know you've all been doing your reading every day and thinking about what does identity have to do with genocide? Absolutely correct, yes. Sir, you have? Uh, basically, uh, identity is an integral part uh, of, of genocide because uh, uh, genocide was always committed by, by members of one identity, the uh, beach, uh, race, state, or anything else against members of another identity. So that, that, that's that. Also correct, sir. Or, uh, um, uh, memory. Uh, Uh, genocide is part of some uh, nas uh, histori historical uh, national memoir. Well, the three of you are, are very much uh, on for Identity has everything to do with genocide. People kill other people because of their perceived identities, both positive and negative. Now, what, and one of the weird things about genocide is that people do identify with it. Do you remember the three basic categories of the historical actors I spoke about? With regard to genocide, can anyone tell me what those three basic categories of historical actors were? Perpetrators, victims, and bystanders. If you remember from if you remember anything from what I said all oh, those weeks ago when I was here before. Uh, before. The commission and memory of genocide has everything to do with identity for all three of those categories. And as I've also said, I, in, in these terms, identity is a matter of both individual, which you all understand, and what do I mean by collective identity? What is a collective identity? Sir? Say because, because certain, certain people in a group share this one aspect of their identity and so they're seen as a whole. Like, a Correct, such as? The religion. Yeah. A religion, indeed. And primarily what else? Nation, state, nationalities. Can you imagine being a Rwandan today without thinking about genocide? Can you be a Jew in the world today without thinking about genocide? Can you be an Armenian? This is one of the, inter uh, um, just one other interesting thing. People form their identities connected in one way or another with mass murder. And that has implications. That has tremendous implications for individual identity and for collective identities because we all share different collective identities. What is one of the big collective identities which we talk about all the time in the news and every day today? What it means to be European. 
You, do, do any of you identify yourselves as non-European? Perhaps some of you do. But here in Prague, here in the Czech Republic, here in Europe, you always hear these discussions about values, European values. What are European values? Well, according to one historian, Tony Judd, and others, in fact, European values are built on genocide, on an understanding of genocide, on the guilt associated with genocide, and on the sense of victimhood. What is victimhood? What's victimhood? My people suffered, so I feel this. The fact of the matter is, for instance, just with regard to Armenians, modern collective Armenian identity is built largely, but not exclusively, but largely on a sense of victimhood and claiming victimhood. We live in an age when people identify not only with power and the commission of genocide, but people identify with being victims. Is it possible to be a Jew in the world today without thinking about the Holocaust? It's hard. It's possible, but it's hard. And we live in an age when people want to acquire a sense of victimhood. Why? Why would any people, individual or collective, want to be identified with victims? Sir? Well, for one, it helps shape their identity, and the other uh, might be to that, uh, I don't know to say, special privileges, but uh, it would also be a what okay special privileges what do you what do you mean or anyone else what do you mean by special privileges to be a victim of genocide sir if I were to form um, uh, my, my version it would mean that uh, when uh, the victim uh, does anything it's more likely to, to get uh, The rest of the world feels that uh, they suffered enough, so that they are entitled uh, to, to some ex excuses. Very important word. Entitled. My people suffered, so we are entitled to, for instance, compensation. What sort of compensation? Well, with regard to the world Jewish population, with regard to the state of Israel, co monetary compensation from who? From the Germans, from Germany. Israeli, the Israeli economy is largely built from the 1950s on compensation received from Germany both collective and individual. Compensation, well, my family was deported from Prague, but 70 years later, I want what? My grandparents' apartment back. But if I don't have a status of victim, how can I make how can I convince society that I, individually, or we, collectively, are entitled to compensation? 
So it's sort of a weird thing, but the fact is we live in an age when people want to be identified as victims. As opposed to, say, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, when the identification was, well, we're a powerful nation, we wish to show off our, our power. So, I want you to think about this, that identity, we are Roma today. How do we break the prejudice against the Roma in Europe today? There are, of course, many ways of answering that question, but one way is to get the majority populations to understand we were victims, and therefore we deserve different treatment. We are entitled to different treatment. And it's weird. Why would someone want to be identified with murder? These may seem like obvious questions, but they're often not thought about. And I would like, I invite you, I would like you to think about them. So, what I'm trying to do Okay, I'm going to speak a little bit about the exam, which is all about identity, right? You want to be identified with a better grade than a worse grade, correct? For practical reasons and for other reasons as well. I'm going to speak more about the, the type of question later, but in a class like this, in an introduction to a subject like this, you guys cannot become experts on each single fact about each genocide. That's not what we're asking on the exam. What I will ask you on the exam is to think more conceptually, more generally, if you will, about the subject of genocide. I will ask you to organize your thoughts. That's why the exam is take home and not in class. Because I want you above anything else to do what in your exploration of genocide? I want you to think about these things. That's why you sit home and write instead of in the classroom under pressure and try to write sensible things about a very complicated subject. That and the fact that I hate reading people's handwritings. <laughs> which is also a very practical issue, right? It goes without saying, you guys, we haven't really spoken about this, how we're going, to, I suppose we're going to ask you to submit them by email. But nonetheless, it goes without saying that your exams have to be word processed printed out, right? And not handwritten. All right? Good. So, the empirical details, when I ask you to answer the questions, the empirical details are important, but they're not, if you get a fact wrong, it's less important than your thinking about different concepts within the subject, okay? Because I, in, when I first began teaching Holocaust history, I did do multiple choice or short answers. And then it occurred to me that's really the wrong way to, because this is a university, we have to test your knowledge, we have to judge your results from the course, and how do I have questions? If I was to say, okay, how many people died at Treblinka? 975,800. No, 935,350. Is it important, the fact? If you were to publish something about it, yes. But in this sense, it's not important to understand, to remember to know the exact figure. What is important is to understand something of how those people got there, why they were sent to Treblinka, and why upon arrival they were gassed to death. And once again, 
each of those questions, you can add one way of approaching them is to think about identity. Let me, why did the Germans kill a million Jews in a small factory of death 75 kilometers northeast of Warsaw? Why? Well, the obvious answer is they were Jews. But what does that tell us? What is identifying that group as Jews tell us about the Germans? What does it tell us about the victim group, et cetera, et cetera? So the exam is meant for you to think about the subject. And another very important point which I want to make is you will not be graded on your English, and I say it, we say it in the syllabus, you will not be graded on your English grammar. Okay? You all have spell checks, so that's a good thing. But what I want you to do is to think. I don't want you worrying about, oh, is this spelling exactly correct? Is this verb correct, et cetera. You have to be coherent, obviously, in the exam, but it, this is not a class of English grammar, okay? So I want you concentrating on thinking rather than on the, such technical details. So, let me read something to you. See if you agree or disagree. This was written in the mid-1980s by a very prominent uh, historian. He, he said, researching and teaching genocide, to point out the obvious, is not quite like researching and teaching everything else. It is special in a way that is not commonly discussed for a variety of reasons, among them the fact that this is an emotionally heavy topic. The questions historians put about genocide tend to become broad rather than narrow and require the making of distinctions frequently avoided in other fields of studies. Genocide studies has become exemplary I hope you all understand the word, has become exemplary in the demands, in the demands that it makes upon researchers, teachers, and students alike. Now, I don't know how you've experienced your exploration of the subject of genocide, but this is also part of what I want you to reflect on in your exam how the study of genocide has affected you as an individual. If it surprised you, if it was interesting, if it was boring. So I'm going to ask you to reflect upon your encounter with genocide studies as well, okay? In fact, this gentleman wrote that about Holocaust studies, but I believe it's very applicable for genocide studies as well. When you guys have left your class, have you spoken about this course with others? Your friends, your family, boyfriends, girlfriends, things like that. Parents, you have. Why? Do you normally go home and talk about your courses? Or somehow is this subject been different? Some of you, wh why have you spoken about this course with others? Why? Someone other than this kind gentleman. One of you young ladies here. What? I feel that this subject isn't discussed enough, so when I go into conversation, I can include other people into this program. Okay. It's not been discussed enough, as you understand it. But there's only 5,000 new books a year, every year, published about Holocaust and genocide, history and memory. So someone's discussing it, but it's an important question. Does society discuss this issue sufficiently, either in terms of quantity or quality?
Does genocide studies have implications for society? Do gen sorry, bad English. Do genocide studies have implications for society? Yes or no? This young lady seems to think that yes, it does. You wanted to share some of your knowledge. And again, this is not always the case that kids study in a university, then go home or go out to a pub and say, oh, let me tell you about my course. But this course, I'm guessing, you've done that a little bit, correct? With friends or family. Or who knows, strangers. Hey, let me tell you about this course I'm taking. <laughs> The question always is why? Why has it not been discussed enough in your estimation? Sir? Because it brings up uh, topics that, that, uh, that can be uh, either difficult or uncomfortable to, to address. But let alone uh, elaborate Okay. Emotionally difficult, intellectually difficult, socially difficult. Oh man, this is a party. Don't talk to me about dead Jews. We're here to have fun. But there's something that compels thinking about the subject. I dare. Yes. So, and one of the things we're talking about today, which you have now undergone, which I think about constantly, is how to teach about this subject. And yes, I'm, we're going to ask you to evaluate, but I'd, I'd like to... Can this subject be taught conventionally? What's the best way of teaching genocide? There are some examples, some people, believe me, kids, neo-Nazis, skinheads, right-wing extremists, they'll go visit a concentration camp like their teachers tell them, and then they write in the book afterwards, thanks for telling us how it's done. Do, you t do I teach the Holocaust? Because I certainly don't want any of you learning how to make a better gas chamber after you've taken this course. But there are some people who do think in those terms. So again, this subject distinguishes itself, genocide studies, because of its content, which is unequivocally mass death. How do you teach mass death? How do you represent mass death? What are some of the ways Holocaust and genocide is represented in the public sphere? It's like something that only really happened once, I don't know, like from like learning about genocide before in school, we only ever learned about Holocaust. That was it. Right. Okay. Only learning about it once. But th that doesn't answer my, that doesn't address my question of how do you represent mass death in an educational way? In a setting. Now there are some people, there are some teachers, you can read about this sort of stuff, that would ask their students, okay, everybody go stand, all, what are we, 30 or 40 here, everyone stand in a very small, say, three square meter space. Everyone stand together. And then you will understand how it felt to be in an apartment in a ghetto. Is that a proper representation? Or is that a morally problematic way of teaching, as some people have argued. Do you understand the Holocaust better if I ask everyone, take your shoes off and let's put them in a pile and you'll see a pile of shoes just like you can see at Auschwitz or at Majdanek. 
You can see warehouses filled with glasses, with false arms, legs, prosthetics, shoes, etc. I was thinking as well, how many of you, what did I ask here? How many of you are Czechs? Okay, about half, even less. How many of you have been to Lidice? Upon which your nation's identity is largely built. How many of you have visited Teretzin, Theresienstadt? Many more. Why? Why did you go? It's a go. It's the. And li I'm not criticizing you at all. It's the go-to trip. Oh, I'm looking forward to eighth grade. We're going to go to Teresin. But honestly, that's what my boyfriend told me about Teresin is on day one, and they just right, and that's what. That's what was his memory of Jersey was. Because the history teacher took a group of 14 year old boys and just put them there. It was beautiful sign. And they were like, yeah, you were just drinking. Like, people didn't care about the world. So study genocide and get drunk. Yeah. It's not a bad tactic, I can tell you that sometimes. Because <laughs> it's a very depressing subject. How do you teach depressing? subjects. These are important pedagogic questions which you guys have been experiencing both as students and learning about the subject. Now these are perhaps not obvious questions but they are very much part of our exercise. What's another form of representation? Okay I've just mentioned public memorials. What are other forms of representation of genocide? Museums. Museums, indeed. Discussions with the survivors. Discussions with survivors, yes. It's like uh, uh, institutions. Yes. And. Uh, uh, <coughs> Conference. Conferences, academic activities, indeed. What else? Documents. Well, they represent, yes, but I'm talking after the fact, not, histor not evidence in that sense. Very important, of course, but not what I was referring to. Other forms of representation. Such, such as? Let's all play concentration camp guards. See how we react. It's been done. Has anyone ever heard of the Milgram experiments? Anyone ever heard of the Milgram experiments? Where people were given dials to see how much pain their peers could take. Turns out, oh, scientifically, methodologically, very badly done. But they, it became part of the, 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 the story. What are other forms of representation? Art. And what we will talk, look at and talk about today. Film. How do you represent genocide on film? Why do you represent genocide? If you produce a film about the Holocaust, you are almost guaranteed to get an Oscar discussion around your film. Why? Because they've all been great films? Or not? So 
And what I do, what we do, is also a form of representation. We represent, Professor Baumgarten represented the Roma and Sinti tragedy during the wars to you. He didn't bring you back to that time. This is true of all history, but again, this subject has special parameters, different from many other histories. So how we represent these issues is of great importance. And even I, I, I cannot sh show you. I can give you a million details about Holocaust history. Does that bring you into the history? No, it represents the history. It represents the subject. And always the question is why? To what end? We often talk about the motivation of perpetrate. Why do people kill other people in large numbers? My question here is, why did you guys sign up for this course? What were your motives? Because just because everyone says, oh, it's important, well, people say lots of things are important, doesn't mean you take a course in it, doesn't mean you think about it, doesn't mean you spend your money. Why do people spend their hard-earned money and spend their holiday at Auschwitz? Because it's fun? Oh, Dad, let's go to Birkenau this year. How many kids do you think? No, because people say, excuse me, people say it's important, but always the question, why is it important? And why would a family spend their hard-earned money to go to southwest Poland and look at gas chambers? Why? Sir? I would argue that uh, it's for the same reason uh, why we study history, uh, and the answer is uh, to, to, to learn from it and hopefully, uh, and hopefully uh, use that, that knowledge to, uh, to uh, better our futures, which, uh, which doesn't always work out, but I think uh, the effort, uh, at the very least, is commendable. Okay. Is there any evidence we learn from history? Not really. Not really. And what is one of the cliches, what is, what is one of the moral statements so closely identified with the Holocaust? Two words. Never again. And now you guys who are becoming experts on genocide, how many genocides were conducted in the 20th century alone? Five, six, more. And in another class I'm teaching now, are there any genocides currently happening in the world today? It's not. Sorry? I, I, someone said something? Islamic State. Islamic State? Okay. Sudan. Uh, Sudan, Darfur. Is the Islamic State a genocidal political entity? Yes or no? And again, to go back on identity, what did we just have the spectacle, and this man is an, a, an incredible spectacle, of identity in the center of the... Is the US president still important in the world today? Yeah, the US is still an important, powerful nation. So what, hap what will be the, the implications if the US e elects a racist bigot as president? 
who says, by identifying people in a certain way, I will make you safer. Do you think that's a winning campaign statement? There's a lot, there's growing evidence that it is. By identifying these people and keeping them out of the US, what are they called? Oh yeah, Muslims. So he's identifying all Muslims as potential genocidaires. Is this right? Is this wrong? Is it morally tenable? And it's in the center of US politics right now. Genocidal potentials. So these things are all connected. They are all connected. And how we teach about them, how we represent them to the general public is very important because we are supposed to learn something about history so as to never again have a genocide. Is that the purpose of this course? To prevent genocides in the future? Perhaps. That's pretty goddamn ambitious. If just by teaching this course, we're going to prevent genocide. H highly unlikely. So, the manner in which we represent genocide has great political and social impact. What's one of the, I think it's the last Holocaust film per se to get best picture. Anyone know? Yeah. 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 I don't think it got, be did it get best, I don't think. Yeah, be uh, best actor. Life is Beautiful, the Italian film, right? One of the only films I've walked out on in the last 25, 30 years. I thought it was a horrible film that said nothing about the Holocaust, but it was rewarded in the best way that that form of art, that form of representation, can be rewarded. Why? Et cetera, et cetera. So, that's what we're speaking about today, is how you represent mass death. How you represent humiliation how you represent the degradation of the human spirit. This is also art. And there are very many mediums for that art. Now, it's very interesting what, this, what you said, that a history teacher in the Czech Republic easily decides to go on a course trip, and then the result are everyone has fun and gets drunk. How much learning do you think took place there? Probably not much. It is possible to represent genocide badly. And it is possible to... Ladies, could you please put your phones away or, or whatever? It's a little bit distracting. And now I'm just... What was I talking about? Better presentation. Yeah, but, but what aspect? <laughs> so, is when you when you see a film about the Holocaust, what, does anyone know any films on genocide on other genocides? Um, the Killing Fields. The Killing Fields, which was about what genocide? Uh, the Khmer Rouge. About the Cambodian genocide, indeed. Hotel Rwanda. And it, how many of you have seen Hotel Rwanda? Which is a very powerful film. Very, yes? Shooting dogs. Shooting dogs, indeed. Are there any long films on the Armenian genocide? I don't, not that I can think of. But there, is, there are films, there's hundreds of films about the Holocaust, a number of films about the Rwandan genocide, several films about the Cambodian genocide. Which are, but you guys have to understand, these are artistic 
decisions taken by talented people who say, I want to represent, to repeat myself, mass death. How do you do it? And always the question, why do you do it? So, one of the foundations of the way we've represented genocide in this course, and one of the things I will want you to, to think about on the exam, is can genocides be compared and contrasted? Can they? Of course they can, and we do so. That's the foundation of this class, is a comparison and contrasting. And what? This gentleman says the Islamic State is genocidal. Correct or not? How can you come to that decision? Only by comparing their activities with the activities of other mass murderers. Their motivations, their methods, their goals. What is the goal of the Islamic State that is threatening us today? To take over Prague? To found it the poor Islamic belief basis for salvation. For salvation. Economic? Yes, I think that the leaders of the Islamic State is not the leaders of the people that establish it. They are just under the power of the leaders. Okay, this young lady is saying that the Islamic State's motivations are primarily economic. I think uh, I, I disagree because uh, um, motiv 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 motivation of uh, Okay. Why did you guys are all you guys are younger? You perhaps don't remember prior to 9/11 itself, the Taliban in Afghanistan committed an act of cultural vandalism. Does anyone remember? Does anyone know what they did? What the Taliban did? They blew up two ancient statues of Buddha. Why? For reasons of identity. Of ideology and identity, going back to that question. So again, and I do emphasize this, when you think about the, the motivations for genocide, think about identity. What were the Armenians, what were the Turks' motivation against the Armenians? And why does, Turk, why does modern Turkey so resolutely official Turkey deny that it was a genocide? Because they don't want their national identity based upon murder. They don't want that. But in, perhaps the Islamic ideologues of the Islamic State want their caliphate identity based upon mayhem and murder. So once again, the motivations for genocide, oddly enough, are very connected to individual and collective identity. Okay.
Is it most important to define genocide historically, morally, or legally? Because if we have discussions in society, one of the problems, and certainly one of the problems of teaching the subject, there's very little time. They're incredibly complex subjects, and there's very little time to discuss. So if we have to concentrate, how do we define genocide most effectively? As a historical question? As a legal question? Or as a moral question? question. Again, something for you guys to think about. So, what I want to do now and genocide is very, very much a matter of language as well. It's another point I wanted to make. The language of genocide and mass murder is very important. What do you do with something illegal? Put it in jail. You eliminate it from society in some... So we have illegal immigrants. Is that a good term? Or is that a bad term? More now, for instance, uh, to, to speak about the American election again, Hillary Clinton and her campaign have decided not to use that term anymore. Illegal immigrant because it creates images, it creates ideas. And what we also know about genocide is it is a... Jews are a poison in the blood of the body of the nation. What do you do to poisons to become healthy? You eliminate the poison. And remember what I said about genocide being the, the search for utopia and the search for social improvement? Well, there are people who think if we only eliminate illegal immigrants, we have a better society. And once again, the U.S. has a spectacle of a leading political figure who's saying, the first thing I'm going to do is deport 11 million people. What does that mean? Can you deport 11 million people harmlessly, easily, effectively, or will people die? Will families be ripped apart? Will economics be affected? Well, presumably, yes. But the solution that this guy is pushing is this will make the US a better society. This country has said the Czech Republic will be a better society if we do not admit refugees. Your politicians are saying that. Prague will be a better city without Syrian refugees. Yes or no? These are all connected questions which in the worst case scenarios have led time and again to mass murder, to genocide to the massive violation of human rights. Are human rights a good thing in Europe today? Yes or no? Raise your hands if you think human rights are a bad thing. No one's raising their hands. So human rights must be a good thing, yes? 
Genocide is a fundamental and massive violation of the most fundamental human right, which is what? Right to life. Is that why you choose, chose this course? To understand human rights better? Is genocide studies human rights studies? In some ways it is. Not exclusively, but that's a, a, a cornerstone of genocide studies. How do you represent in art, in education, in politics, how do you represent genocide? This is our question for today, which again is all connected to all the questions we've been speaking about. So language and genocide is extremely important. And the language used by, if you identify a people as vermins, then there's only one thing you can do, make society healthy. There has been, so far as I know, with regard to the Rwandan genocide, one individual convicted of the crime of genocide. I don't know if Martin spoke about this particular individual, but what was he convicted for? What was his position? He was the head of Rwandan state radio. And he defined the Tutsis as cockroaches. What do you do with cockroaches when you see them in your kitchen? Jump up on the table. <laughs> and then jump off the table and try to kill them, right? It's, it's, it's in your interest to eliminate cockroaches. So understanding and preventing genocide is very intimately connected to the language of genocide. And language is a form of representation. Once again, and I think about this, and I'm saying it because we have a growing problem in a very important election coming up in the US. And that is a man who says, this group is a problem. And he's getting increasing support for his position that this group is a problem. He is representing them as what? I've just said it. A problem. And what is a politician's job in a democratic society, theoretically? <laughs> to solve problems, to get rid of problems. And if I convince enough of you that Muslims, all of them, are such a problem we have to close our borders, I've convinced you of a very important thing. So the way we write and talk about genocide is a form of representation and a very important part of genocide studies language, how we talk about these things. Okay, let's take a break now till, tw a very short break, because we stop at five, right? Ain't no time for nothing. <laughs> it all goes so quickly. Let's resume at 20 after, so just stretch your legs, take a, some fresh air, and then we will resume, okay? And I'll show you segments of a couple of films to talk about how genocide, to show how genocide, in this case the Holocaust, is represented. <laughs>